You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 17, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, update on therapies for food allergy. Our presenter is Dr. Edwin Kim. He's the Division Chief at the University of North Carolina Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. All right, so uh, good morning, everybody. It's September 17th, a beautiful Friday in Kansas City. Weather's starting to get a little bit nicer. Um, This is our first of two presentations on conferences online and allergy. Um, We're fortunate to have Dr. Edwin Kim uh, today. He's going to speak on uh, update on therapies for food allergy. Um, Dr. Kim, and please correct me uh, again because I got this off the, the web, Associate Professor in Allergy and Immunology at UNC. Yep. Okay, good. Um, currently director of the UNC Food Allergy Initiative, which investigates the biological basis of food allergy as well as new forms of immunotherapy uh, as treatment for food allergy. Um, with that, Dr. Kim, thank you. All right. Well, I'm glad to be here and thanks for having me back. Hopefully um, I have a, a, some new material this year uh, that hopefully will be interesting and help us to really be thinking about um you know, what we can do for our food allergy patients, because for too many years, we've just diagnosed and then kind of wish people luck. And actually, that'll be some of the information we'll go into. Um, and uh, if if any of the audio or video goes funny, if people can flag me and just let me know, that way I don't just keep talking on and on. But uh, here we go. And so uh, first, I do have some disclosures, um, and uh, some of them are related to food allergy. Uh, I've tried very hard to just be a very, very balanced talk to talk about all the different therapies that are um, in development at this point, and you see my disclosures that are here. And so sort of the objective, of course, is going to be to to give sort of the overview of the food allergy problem, and, you know, after how many years of pro-con debates and everything at the, the annual meetings. I think most people realize uh, sort of the background on food allergy, but I never want to assume, so I'll go into that kind of briefly. Um, a little bit about the current management of, of peanut allergy and um, and then sort of the drawbacks of it. And really here what we're talking about is, is avoidance. Um, and then the other uh, therapies that are either recently approved or in development, and that will be the, the meat of the talk to try to go over sort of what's out there now, some pros and cons, and really, if anything, just to prepare us uh, as providers for what might be coming down the pike and how we might want to uh, be able to advertise and, and discuss these with, with our patients. And so uh, I always do start with this one slide here, which uh, for anyone in the allergy field, they're going to be very familiar with, but it still is critical just to make sure we're all talking about the same type of food allergy. So we know our patients, really any problems that they have with the food, they're going to attach the word allergy to. And that's not their fault. That's, you know, again, they see an adverse event, something makes them feel bad with food, out, with food, and they will call it an allergy. But when we're talking about food allergy, especially with these particular treatments, we are really talking about IgE, meaning food allergy. And so here in this um, in picture, and I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse, but the top section of this slide where it's white is that sensitization phase. So you initially get exposed, your body makes IgE, and then the, the lighter green or the lime green section there talks about sort of that subsequent exposure. So once your mast cells basophils are primed with that IgE, you get exposed again. And in this case, with the picture of a peanut, you have your uh, cross-linking of IgE, release of your vasoactive uh, mediators like histamine, and then, of course, all the symptoms uh, leading up to potentially uh, and including anaphylaxis. So, again, critical to remember that this is the type of food reaction we're talking about uh, when we're talking about our treatments. Now, of course, we also know that lots and lots and lots of people have food allergy that's out there, and it is difficult to come up with super accurate numbers, and people have used all different sort of means and proxies to try to come up with this, uh, but I think everyone agrees that there's, there is a lot, and there's a lot more than there was when many of us were younger child, children and definitely in our parents' generations um, where food allergy really was either not heard of or a very rare thing. But um, you know, as a pediatrician, what I would say is the, the stat that continues to really uh, ring true for me is this concept that there's uh, approximately two kids in every classroom in the U.S. that may have a food allergy. And, you know, just the sheer number and acceptance of the concept of peanut-free tables, I think, really just kind of makes this point clear that food allergies are everywhere. 
Now, our uh, standard of care up to 2020 uh, was avoidance. And so really, again, hear the story, make the diagnosis, and then give the patient some advice on how to avoid things. We had our Food Allergy Labeling Consumer Protection Act, which is now many years old. Uh, and uh, during in that law, it, the eight major food allergens had to be clearly listed. And just like you see in this picture, the very, very clear-cut uh, descriptions, contains milk, contains egg, these are part of that law. And those eight major foods uh, you all know is going to be milk, egg, wheat, soy, and then uh, peanut, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Now, I have an asterisk there, there because you all probably are also aware that um, sesame will be added to that list, and a lot of companies are, have been given the opportunity to start um, uh, voluntarily listing that, but by, I believe, next year, if not the year after, they will be required by the law to also list if sesame is an ingredient, which um, just by the number of people that are out there that are now being diagnosed with sesame allergy, this will be a, a big positive for them. Now, of course, we also know the voluntary label. So in the picture on the bottom right where we have the made in a factory that uses nut ingredients and, uh, you know, all different language like this, uh, we I think we, we're all familiar with these. And uh, what's important here is that these are voluntary, so they're not regulated. And unfortunately, for many patients, they're very confusing. And uh, I've had all manner of patients come in with different perspectives on these. Some of them avoid all labels, no matter what they say. Others kind of put um, meaning or importance to certain ones. So, oh, you know, traces, that's not okay, but made in a plant, maybe that's okay. And, and different things like that. And unfortunately, with these voluntary labels, I don't know that you can really do that. Uh, because it is unregulated, there's not sort of a milligram dose or anything that is related to that. So um, I, I would say that the risk of cross-contamination with these voluntary labels is going to be very, very, very small. Uh, but unfortunately, with our patients, it's hard to actually make any guarantees there. So there is sort of a um, kind of risk-benefit that patients, as well as us as providers giving advice on this, uh, are taking with this. But uh, really, again, th these labels, and it just kind of brings brings the point that avoidance is really, really, really hard for families. And um, here I, I talk about this a lot. This is a study that's fairly old now, um, published by uh, David Fleischer as part of COFAR. But uh, I think what's key here is just understanding that there was an observational study where infants were enrolled to look for the development of food allergy as well as what happens after that. And they knew that they were being watched for food allergy and accidental ingestions. And even in this situation, it happened. So 72% of the infants in this study had reactions. Uh, most were accidental, but not all, which is interesting. Um, uh, and then more than half, a little bit more than half, had actually more than one reaction over this period of time of observation. Um, and these are people that kind of voluntarily signed up for these studies. So, you know, they're, they mo I would imagine they're aware of what they're signing up for, and they're aware of food allergy. And even in those cases, reactions were happening. In addition, avoidance uh, is not, in my mind, is not harmless. And I think this is something that maybe is more coming out in the last couple of years than maybe had been in the past. Uh, I think there was sort of this thought that uh, we really just focus on, I think, the physical uh, consequences of food allergy. And so with avoidance, you don't have a reaction, everything's fine. But I think, especially any of us who live with it, but even as providers, I think we all now recognize that this is not necessarily the case. And uh, there is a very negative uh, effect on quality of life that can happen with this. And that could be based on social isolation. So we see this happen a lot where um, you know, kids that are living, or kids, even adults that have food allergy may not be participating in uh, different activities that other people may have, uh, may be participating in. And this may be simple things like birthday parties, uh, sleepover uh, parts, um, you know, camps, all these types of stuff. And, you know, we can make the argument that do you really need to avoid it, do you not? But the point is, uh, right now, that's what people are doing because we just don't have a great solution. And so they're restricting these daily activities. And then there is just this constant fear. And I think that is another aspect that um, is not always sort of initially grasped. So, you know, I, I even say for my own, I actually have two, two um, food allergic children. And for them, you know, of course, 99.9% .9 of the time, basically when they're not eating the food they're allergic to, they on the surface appear completely normal and they are physically. Um, and so I think there, there's sort of this assumption that they're just like everybody else. But I think what we forget is, you know, for a lot of these kids and the families, 
there is this constant concern that, oh, that next thing that they eat or that place that they go to, something bad can happen. And so this constant fear really does weigh on these kids, even though, again, on the surface, everything may look fine. Uh, and then Ruchi Gupta has shown us very well that there is this tremendous cost that is associated with food allergy um, and her numbers estimated at $25 billion per year. And this was not only medical costs, actually that was a smaller proportion, but really just the cost of living with this. So whether it's going to be uh, where you live, what schools you go to, what foods you get, uh, unfortunately, healthy food as well as non-allergenic food generally is not cheaper. If anything, it's going to be typically more expensive. And so there, you know, I just used all that intro just to make the point again, uh, avoidance is what we've done, but I'm not sure that that is good enough. And, and again, it's not necessarily harmless. So really, again, uh, brings, brings the need for treatment um, to the forefront. And so here I just kind of make a, a quick point, and you know, this is of course not meant for anyone to actually look at carefully or memorize, but really just the idea that our, you know, I use this to say, you know, our body is meant to, to tolerate foods, right? So uh, if you think about it, everything that we eat is foreign to our body. It doesn't belong there, but we're not allergic to all the zillion different things that we are eating. And so our body has these natural mechanisms to create oral tolerance or to induce oral tolerance. But unfortunately, in food allergies, something happens. So in these patients, whether they're genetically predisposed or there's environmental or whatever it may be, um, there is a breakdown of this oral tolerance. And suddenly something that are, uh, that other people and the um, can eat and not have sort of an immune reaction uh, in patients with allergy, it does trigger sort of an allergic reaction. And you see sort of in this diagram over here, you have the dietary allergenic protein that is down at the bottom. It crosses through the intestinal epithelium. Uh, and then you have um, potentially if you go straight up in that pathway, you'll have that TH2 response. So that's going to be triggering our B cells, our mast cells, our eosinophils, uh, and leading to the symptoms of food allergy. Now, ideally, we actually have our regulatory mechanisms, our suppressive mechanisms that create that oral tolerance. But like I mentioned, when it comes to food allergy, it just seems like it is broken. So how can we, in someone who's allergic, come back and actually block that food allergy pathway? So we re, uh, revive or, or reinstitute that suppression of that oral tolerance. All right, so uh, here again, uh, the, the, the type of treatment or the class of treatment that has been most studied when it comes to food allergy, and here I'm going to say peanut allergy actually because the majority of um, studies that have been out there to this point have been focused on peanut allergy, and we, we think of this, uh, or I, I think of this as sort of the model food allergy at this point. It is one that uh, is prone to causing probably more severe reactions. We know that the majority of kids do not outgrow this, uh, and it is a lifelong treatment if we don't intervene. Uh, but the, of course, the hope would be that anything we learn about the mechanisms of developing and then treating peanut allergy can be extrapolated to the other foods. And so here you just see sort of across um, the three pictures here, the three different forms of immunotherapy that have been most studied to this point. And when we say immunotherapy, we are thinking very similar to what we think of with allergy shots. So this basic idea that we take what you're allergic to, and then we gradually increase, we expose, and we gradually increase that dose uh, in an effort to, to retrain the immune system and to bring back oral tolerance as best as possible. So we'll start talking about oral immunotherapy, which has by far been the most studied. And... <clears throat> same picture I've been using for quite a while and the same happy boy over here who's eating his oral immunotherapy. Um, and so here what we're talking about is eating pretty sizable amounts, so milligram to gram quantities of the food that that person may be allergic to. Um, again, most often studied as peanut. Um, and at least in the research world, we've really studied this uh, as um, the food in a flower form. And, uh, you know, the main reason we do that, at least in our research, is uh, it helps us with standardization, it helps us with purity, because we are using this as a medicine, and so trying to get it to uh, levels that are approved by the FDA. Um, and then also for measurement. So again, we do, we are intentionally giving the kids, uh, and adults, but kids in particular, what they are allergic to, and that risk of allergic reactions are always going to be there. So we do think that it is vitally important that we are precise in measuring and with the steps of our, our treatment protocol. So it's not sort of the eyeball kind of thing with the, the measuring spoon necessarily, but we want to be very, very exact with this. Um, 
And then again, at least uh, in the flower forms that we have used, uh, it's not really palatable. Uh, you know, a lot of folks kind of hear it and think, oh, this would be wonderful, you know, as a topping on whatever. But what we usually use is a defatted, non-sweetened type of flour, which is very, very hard to, to eat. And so typically it's going to be mixed in a vehicle food. Uh, in our studies, most commonly we've used applesauce and say pudding, but kids have tried ice cream, kids have tried frosting, kids have tried all kinds of stuff uh, in just a, a way to kind of get this um, ingestion. All right, and so uh, I'm just going to fast forward, of course, lots of sort of small investigator studies, including many at our site here at UNC were done. Uh, but really, again, we're, uh, the key studies that we'll talk about with oral immunotherapy are going to be um, the recent ones that were done by AMU. So first here, you see a reference to the phase two study that was um, authored by, John, um, by Drew Bird at Southwestern, as well as the other investigators uh, involved in the trial. And then, of course, the study now that most of us are uh, very familiar with, the pivotal uh, New England Journal study uh, called Palisade that was published in uh, sorry November of 2018. And here, just the, the, the one slide that I'll highlight from Palisade is going to be their primary outcome. And so here, you see sort of broken up into ages. So on the left half is going to be the 4 to 17-year-old group, which is the majority of patients if you look at the N numbers. And then they did enroll older adults, but again, the N was very, very small here, so they couldn't really make any conclusions uh, off of the age group, uh, the older age group. But focusing in on the 4 to 17-year-old age group, what they find here is this primary outcome is right here in the middle. And what this is, is again, just reminding yourself about how food challenges work. Food challenges are typically a cumulative dose that we're testing against, but given sort of in a graded stepwise fashion. Uh, so um, that first dose is typically very, very small, maybe one or three milligrams. That next dose may be a slight step up, so maybe three to 10 milligrams and 30 and going upwards. And so what we see represented over here is actually the interval dose within that food challenge. Uh, so there was a 300 milligram dose in the food challenge. The next dose after that was 600 milligrams, and the final dose, or um, or that the next dose after that was 1,000 milligrams. Now keep in mind that um, cumulative is uh, another way that numbers are often presented in the data uh, or in the literature. And so this 600 milligram interval dose actually represents 1,043 milligrams. Accumulative. So just, again, making sure that people are aware of what, what we're talking about here. Um, and also, I should add in as a reference, we usually think of about 300 milligrams of peanut protein to be the equivalent of about one peanut kernel. Um, so here, what we're talking about at 1,000 milligrams is three plus, um, uh, three plus peanuts uh, worth of peanut that they're eating. In the darker bar here, you see the treatment group that's on the AR101 peanut OIT versus placebo, and it doesn't take much to just recognize huge, huge difference. Nearly 70% of uh, participants in the study were able to tolerate this dose uh, versus almost nobody in the placebo group. So this easily met statistical significance. Um, and of course, then ultimately led to approval of the actual product as of January in 2020. Um, many of you on the call may, have, uh, may now even be um, starting to use this in your clinics. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that uh, we are going to learn from as well. So, of course, we've seen what's happened in the trials, but we want to see what real life is going to be like um, and when we have sort of our average Joe families that are out there and, you know, how well does this work in those situations? How well does this work in non-academic um, clinics as well? Now, other data has come out that continue to support the, the, the treatment effect of peanut OIT. So there was a study called Artemis. And so this was a um, study that was done in Europe, 175 participants across these countries that you see here, the UK, Ireland, France, Germany, uh, Italy, Spain, and Sweden. And it was slightly different um, than, than the Palisade study. So what, for one, the entry criteria was slightly higher. So in Palisade, uh, people had to react to, uh, at one third of a peanut, 100 milligrams or less. And here they increased that slightly, but they also made the primary outcome more stringent. So I remember uh, the slide before I showed you the US study uh, kept the 600 milligram or the 1,043 milligram cumulative as the primary outcome. And they made a tougher uh, outcome in Europe up to 1,000 milligrams or 2,043 cumulative. Uh, the treatment was still the same. It's still the same 300 milligram AR101. Uh, but the, another change that they made in this study was actually a shorter treatment period. So in the U.S., the Palisade study was a 12-month start-to-finish 
uh, treatment period, whereas in, in Europe it was a, a nine months, six months of buildup and three months of maintenance. And interestingly, what they found here was a really good responder rate. So about 58% uh, of of participants on AR101 were able to meet this higher threshold even though it was a shorter treatment period. Uh, and let me hop back one slide just to show you. So again, they did look at this 1,000 milligram in the Palisade study with the longer treatment period. And here what they found was, uh, if you go across here, just about 50% uh, is what they found in the U.S. study. So um, here again, it's going to be similar, if not possibly slightly stronger data than what the Palisade uh, study had shown. So again, supportive of a, a strong desensitization or treatment effect with MFIT. Now I do want to um, go into now um, a, another recent study that was published by Brian Vickery and uh, and the um, the Palisade study group. And so this was a study called ARC4. And this was just uh, ARC, uh, the AMU company basically named their studies numerically. So the Palisade was the ARC3 study. So the ARC4 was a follow-on to that, an open label follow-on study of Palisade. And there were a couple of goals that they, they had, or I say they, but we were actually part of this at UNC. So we all had as investigators is first understanding if you continue to treat, longer, two years, three years, what happens? Is there the same effect? Does the effect get worse? Does the effect get better? But also, I think just the very, very practical question of, well, what if you don't treat as frequently? So if you go to uh, every other day, if you go to a couple times a week, if you go a couple uh, every couple of weeks, you know, are we able to desensitize and then sort of use more interval dosing as a way of maintaining that same level of benefit? Again, I, you can easily see sort of the practical applications of that if that were true. Um, of course, trying to answer all those questions um, leads to a very complicated study design. And so you see here all the different arms that were involved in, in this particular study. Um, but the ones I will focus, focus you in on are going to be here. Cohort number one, this group just treated. So 300 milligrams daily, 28 more weeks. Um, that's what they did. Uh, and then... Cohort two over here, what you end up seeing here is they had a short period of every other day and then uh, spaced it out even more to twice weekly. We have within cohort three, we have 3A, and this was actually a longer treatment group. So 300 milligrams daily, but then they did this for an additional year uh, on top. And then we have a couple of other groups. This group ultimately gets to every other week. And then this is another group that goes for um, twice weekly. And so again, very complicated. It is worthwhile to kind of look through this study to really get in there. But I'll try to hit on the high point here with this um, really complicated looking bar graph. And um, essentially here, what they were trying to look at is across the bottom, you'll see sort of the threshold during food challenge that they measured again. So 600 being what they had, um, you know, what we had used for the primary outcome of the Palisade study. 1,000 being the, the dose that was used during the um, uh, Artemis study in, in Europe. And you see that uh, after the 300, of course, everybody more or less does pretty good. But as you kind of get to more stringent um, criteria or higher thresholds that we're trying to achieve, you definitely see a discrepancy going on. And so then when you go back and try to look at what the difference in the bars are, it kind of makes sense. Uh, so blue was just the placebo group that then switched over to, to uh, active AR101 or or the peanut OIT. Cohort one was just continued a, an additional year and a half total, uh, or not an ad additional half of a year. So one and a half years total of peanut OIT treatment. And then the brown was the two years. This was that 3A group. So this was two full years of treatment uh, with peanut OIT. And so as you go across, if you just focus on those three bars first, um, essentially you have one year, one and a half years, and two years. And as you get to the higher thresholds you're trying to achieve, you notice, oh yeah, it looks like uh, possibly if you treat longer, uh, you may actually have a stronger desensitization, may be able to get higher and higher thresholds. Now the black, green, and the, the yellow, these are all those more interval doses that they had tried to study. And, uh, and basically it's pretty clear that uh, those will fall off. So you see those are not going to be quite as good as if you just continue on treatment for as long as possible. So um, now, again, it's not that these patients are all falling off and going to zero and become everyone 100 percent being reactive, but it doesn't maintain it quite as well. And so I think some take home points given, you know, again, this is a open label extension. This is not sort of designed for this. So there are limitations. But at least this follow-on study does seem to suggest that if you treat longer, you may potentially continue to get even stronger desensitization than you saw after one year. Um, and then that interval dosing, 
um, you know, may potentially not be able to maintain that same level of desensitization. Uh, does it go to zero? Does it maintain a lower level? Again, that's stuff that we'll continue to, to learn at this point. And then what's missing right now that I don't show you here is, yeah, what does that do for compliance? What does that do for safety? Because perhaps, okay, maybe you get a slightly lower desensitization. But if it leads to uh, improved safety with the treatment itself, if it leads to someone being more compliant with it, that trade-off may be reasonable. So uh, again, these are things that as, as providers now that are thinking about and starting to do peanut OIT, hopefully we'll be able to start to learn about things like this. All right, and then uh, with OIT, I just want to wrap up with one other study that uh, has completed and is uh, hopefully going to be published sometime soon. And it, this impact study uh, run by the Immune Tolerance Network, really the main question they wanted to answer is, uh, is there sort of an age effect? Uh, if, does being younger somehow predict a stronger and a longer lasting outcome? Because again, with peanut allergy, most kids do not outgrow it. And so can we, if we intervene early on, can we somehow change that programming and, and potentially have more people outgrowing it? Uh, it was a five-center study uh, looking at one to four-year-olds, and you see the sites here. And the way that we tried to measure uh, this longer-lasting or possibly even tolerance was we treated for two and a half years every day peanut OIT, actually a much higher dose, so 2,000 milligrams on a daily basis compared to the 300 milligrams from uh, Palisade. Uh, and then we actually stopped the treatment for an entire six months uh, and then had those same kids come on back and do a food challenge again to see if they were able to maintain those high levels of time uh, or high levels of desensitization that time far off. Um, is that a perfect proxy for tolerance? Definitely not. Uh, unfortunately, as a field, we're still struggling to figure out how do you sort of define clinical tolerance. But uh, it's still very meaningful in our minds that if you can maintain a high level of desensitization that far off, that, that's pretty good, and no one's going to be missing for six months by accident. So um, we are hoping to see that data sometime soon to get a sense of how strong uh, an effect um, we can have with peanut OIT in this youngest age group. So now, uh, of course, we know peanut OIT is not perfect. Uh, it has strong, strong desensitization like we talked about, but uh, there are definitely safety concerns with the treatment itself. Uh, and it's not surprising because we are giving people what they're allergic to. And so the PACE study was published just shortly before the FDA reviewed the peanut OIT data. And what they showed was people getting peanut OIT compared to avoidance had increased anaphylaxis, uh, frequency of anaphylaxis, increased um, need to use epinephrine to treat reactions, uh, and um, pretty strong relative risks that are there. Um, and so just, again, it's uh, as, as an allergist or as a food allergy researcher, I don't know that any of this was a big surprise, uh, but I do think uh, that it was important and is important to have it out there uh, because as providers and as patients, I think it is important to, to recognize, you know, again, we are giving people what they're allergic to. There is a level of risk here. There is a level of responsibility to make sure that we are doing this right. Just like we would do for allergen uh, immunotherapy, so um, allergy shots, really going through sort of the risks and benefits, making sure that there is understanding and buying from the patients I think is essential. So I think this study really helped us to just make sure that we are all on the same page. Um, now, another aspect that maybe wasn't as discussed, but we are definitely learning, and unfortunately COVID has really brought this out, is that peanut OIT from a logistical point of view is also, you know, not the easiest treatment that's out there. Uh, it requires daily dosing, so from the parent point of view, uh, that might be difficult depending on what the home situation is like. Uh, at this point, we don't think of it as curative, so this is potentially a, a indefinite, maybe lifelong kind of treatment. So, you know, again, some considerations before starting this. Uh, we do know that there are certain cofactors, so whether it's uh, exercise, fever, concurrent illness, some other cofactors, medications, uh, that could potentially increase the risk of an, a reaction to the treatment itself. And so there are some guidelines that are given around the treatment, uh, around the timing of the treatment and how it's given. That can be um, logistically difficult, especially, again, if we're talking about sort of our active uh, adolescents and kids who have all kinds of activities with school and all. Um, and then it requires a lot of visits, actually. So the buildup period is needed because we need to do it uh, safely and in a stepwise fashion. Um, but potentially requiring 10, 11, 12 office visits in that first six months to build up, uh, it can be difficult. Um, and in a non-COVID world, that's already going to be difficult. But of course, in a COVID world where 
you, you know, people are not wanting to go to the office or otherwise. It, it, it is definitely a consideration. And so, um, again, I think these are just things that can be managed and can be overcome, but are important for all of us uh, as providers to be thinking about as we start embarking on p and OIT and potentially other forms of OIT as well. Now, let's see, we're at the halfway part, so let, we'll flip over to the next form of immunotherapy I want to talk about, which is epicutaneous. Um, and just like you see in the picture here, what we're talking about is a, a medicine patch as a form of exposing peanut. Um, and here you see sort of a better picture that comes from the company itself. First, over here in the, in the top right, you see sort of what that actual patch itself looks like. So it's almost like a tegaderm with a foam ring in the middle. And the idea is going to be that um, uh, under, draw, under that patch, within the foam ring, there's peanut that is um, uh, sp sprayed onto there or, dr or dried onto there. And the way that the patch would work is that it is applied to the skin with a good seal or a perfect seal. And then the natural perspiration that comes from the skin then um, solubilizes that peanut and allows for sort of a passive transfer of that peanut through the skin uh, and then ideally or uh, theoretically into the immune system and um, dendritic cells and all that are in the skin that can then receive it and hopefully then take it to the, the lymph nodes and, and cause a tolerogenic effect. Uh, there were a, uh, a couple of smaller studies. Now, what's different versus peanut OIT uh, is with the, um, the, the epicutaneous immunotherapy, it was a proprietary product that wasn't easily replicated. And so there aren't really any uh, PI-initiated studies. They're all uh, done by the company um, who actually creates the, the product. But they did have studies that were run as part of COFAR uh, academic centers, as well as their own sort of industry-sponsored studies as well to try to show what kind of effect this can have. And ultimately, it led to their phase three study called Papites. Uh, again, another study that we've been talking about for a couple of years. And just as a reminder, they uh, did this as an international study. They had 356 children that were randomized. Uh, more on peanut versus than placebo. And then on the far right, you see the, the actual uh, final outcomes or final efficacy. And here, uh, they were looking at responder rate, and what they found was a 35.3% responder rate in, uh, w in patients receiving the peanut patch, their via skin patch, versus 13.6% on the placebo. Um, that response rate on the placebo is a little bit higher than probably they had anticipated. And what's noteworthy here is that the primary outcome that was designed in conjunction with the FDA wasn't just a straight sort of peanut versus placebo, but it was actually looking at the difference in responder rate between peanut and placebo. Uh, and then to add another statistical layer to it, it was actually the confidence interval around this difference. Um, and unfortunately, the, the data did not meet that. Uh, and it's suspected because there was probably a slightly higher than expected placebo rate that it did not meet that. So although there was, again, a statistical difference in the percent on peanut versus placebo, that, um, that difference in the two groups and the confidence interval did not meet the outcome. So this was uh, considered a negative study. Now, they did show that uh, um, safety was there. So one of the benefits of the peanut patch is supposed to be that it doesn't go into the GI tract. And so perhaps it can, uh, and it's able to utilize much, much smaller doses. So 250 micrograms is the amount of peanut that is on each individual patch uh, compared to 300 milligrams that is ingested with peanut OIT. So the hope would be that using smaller doses and non-ingesting might lead to better safety uh, of the treatment itself. And so what they found were uh, lots and lots of people had side effects, but most of them were going to be site, uh, site local reactions, so itching and redness there. And thankfully, uh, serious and severe reactions with the treatment were, were very, very rare with this. So um, maybe does meet the, meet the bar when it comes to, to safety uh, and ease of treatment, uh, but that actual efficacy itself is sort of up in the air. So uh, what happened after that was then they decided, well, just like we would do with any other treatment, whether it's going to be what we talked about with peanut OIT, but also with allergy shots and all, is uh, we keep treating longer because we do suspect that with longer treatment, we may get additional desensitization. So they wanted to try to answer that question for the patch as well. And so they had what they call the PEOPLE study, the Papitz Open Label Extension. 93% um, of the patients that were in that phase three um, the PEET study enrolled in people, and then they uh, treated them for two additional years. So the people data is this sort of this box that's up here um, under the word people that is slightly shaded darker. 
and they had people, uh, or they had, uh, they had patients who were on uh, randomized to, to the active peanut patch for 12 months, then treat for an additional two more years, so three years total. Uh, have a food challenge, and then some, uh, and then not some, they were all offered the option to potentially be assessed for two months of sustained unresponsiveness. So two months of stopping the treatment itself and then coming back to look for this continued desensitization off of therapy. And two different versions of their efficacy are shown here. Uh, and on the left, sort of this little bubble graph that you see here, you have month zero baseline, you have month 12, and then uh, the, the month 36, which is the people data itself, uh, and of course larger bubbles represent more people. And so you see a baseline, uh, not like you would expect, uh, the patients are all sort of at that 300 milligram or less dose, a lot of them in that 1 to 300 milligram range. After 12 months of treatment, there's clearly a shift when you just look at sort of where the bubbles are, but still, again, uh, you know, a bunch, of a bunch of folks that are in that 300 range, so slightly different than, than um, uh, at baseline, but maybe not dramatically. And then at 36 months, you do see um, uh, more uh, larger circles sort of at the higher up doses, suggesting that perhaps for some patients there is an increase. What's interesting is you see a couple of dots that showed up lower that weren't there at 12 months. So what is that? You know, what has happened there? And I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I don't have an explanation for sort of what happened there, whether there's truly a loss or if there's some artifact that might have happened in the study. On the right picture here, you see uh, here as a cumulative reactive dose um, and, and what happens with that across the, the 0, 12, and 36 months. And smack in the middle of each of the bars, you'll see the median uh, cumulative reactive dose. Uh, and that is sort of uh, well, how much of peanut does it actually take before you have an outward symptom. And it does seem like there is a further increase from 444 to 944 uh, with longer treatment. So um, here, again, similar to what we see with peanut OIT, there's a suggestion that longer treatment may lead to stronger desensitization. And uh, that same concept that uh, really treatments are probably intended to be long-term. So I don't know that anyone is thinking about peanut OIT, peanut patch, or anything as being sort of a six months or 12 months and you're done, but more as a long-lasting treatment. So um, this, this could be relevant information. And so uh, the peanut patch was submitted to the FDA. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, what we found there at the FDA was they uh, rejected the application based on the idea that the patch did not seem to adhere as was advertised. And um, uh, and so they are trying to figure out a way to make sure that the patch does what it's supposed to do as far as sticking, because that is, again, the inherent way that it's supposed to work as far as creating essentially this condensation chamber. Um, and so uh, we'll see if the company does um, kind of fix these problems and then resubmit and whether this can be a real option in the future. Um, now, the research with this Vioskin patch has not stopped, and so there is actually a study ongoing now. The original of this was called Epitope, and this was similar to what we looked at with the impact study, trying to see if there is an age effect with the patch as well. So this study looked at one to four-year-old children, uh, same 250 microgram um, dose, and then treat uh, with the patch for one year. And then similar to other uh, studies, they had an open-label extension, which they named Epopex, where treatment would extend out to 36 months. So this study is ongoing at this point as well. Um, and so we'll be curious to see over the next couple of years where this goes, because, um, again, it does seem like the, the safety is, is there. Uh, and definitely the, the concept of sticking something on your skin and then going about your day as opposed to eating, I think, will ring true with a lot of our patients. So um, we'll see. So, um, all right, how are we doing on time? Okay. All right, and then finally we'll go to sort of what's near and dear to my heart, so sublingual. So sublingual is something that uh, I was actually fortunate enough to get involved with as a fellow, and now as, a, as faculty at UNC, I've been able to kind of follow this through, and we've got a couple generations of, of studies on sublingual now as well uh, that I've been talking about for the past few years. And um, 
Again, we hope uh, that this is a, a simple treatment to do. So as you see here, typically it's been given as a liquid, although there are um, dissolving tablets uh, used for sublingual treatment for other indications. Um, there's no pain, of course, that's involved with it. I do think that it's somewhat relevant that um, it does not taste like peanut. Uh, it seems like some of our patients do have a natural aversion to the smell or the, the taste or the texture of peanut. Um, and so not having those potentially could be a benefit here. Now, given uh, it's not tasteless, it actually tastes more like a medicine. And so for kids who don't like medicine, that could be a drawback. Um, the doses that we have been using for sublingual in our studies has been much, much smaller. So uh, we've looked at 2 milligrams and 4 milligrams. And uh, again, in comparison to 300 milligrams that was done in the immune studies and then 2,000 and even 4,000 milligrams that have been done in other studies that are out there. Uh, we originally had done a 12-month interval, um, interval analysis or interim analysis, I'm sorry, that we published way back in 2011. And then we followed all those patients out to three to five years and published this a couple years ago. Uh, but after three to five years of treatment, what we found was um, pretty strong desensitization. So you see sort of all the patients in the study represented here on this bar graph. Now, the first thing I would mention is that there's a range. So it's not that everybody in treatment uh, is off the charts, positive and doing great. We had some patients that are down at the bottom that probably look no different than placebo. So tolerating zero, a couple people just reacted at the very first dose on food challenge, seemingly having no benefit, uh, some at the 250. But on the other side, we actually had a subset, about a third of our patients who actually ate the entire 5,000 milligrams without any symptoms at all. And how far higher could they have gone? We didn't push them, but that would be curious for us. So it does seem like similar to what we saw one year, that there is a treatment effect, uh, but there is a range um, in, in sort of what that treatment effect might look like. Um, and what we also found is, well, back when we first started these studies, it seemed to be this concept of all or nothing. So, you know, we need people full pass, eat tons and tons of tons of peanut. That's going to make them tolerant, and that's what everybody wants. Fast forward to now in the last couple of years, and I think we have changed sort of our tune on this. And so it does seem like many patients uh, out there are not necessarily looking for uh, the ability to eat large amounts of peanuts. Uh, but if anything, uh, this concept of bite-proof protection has kind of come up. Um, this, this term, I think, has been coined by some folks uh, mostly in the um, peanut OIT world. But the idea that uh, patients would continue to avoid peanut, but if they happened to eat something that was cross-contaminated or bit something by accident, that that would not lead to sort of the outward reactions and possible anaphylaxis. Uh, and that's where you see, for example, the primary outcome of, of the Palisade study being 1,000 milligrams cumulative or a 600 milligram interval dose, um, trying to show that, again, there is a cushion of protection. And so with that in mind, we re-looked at our data, and rather than only focusing on the 5,000 milligram group, we looked at sort of a, a middle dose. So, you know, how many of our patients could eat 750 and higher is kind of where we drew the line, artificially no less. Um, and there, what we found is about 86% of our patients could actually tolerate that amount. And so, you know, again, we'd like to think that that is promising, that this uh, a large percentage of our patients has this, what we call bite-proof protection, uh, but also the one-third that has the large, large amount of protection. In this particular study, we stopped the treatment for a month uh, for these patients that reached 5,000 milligram, and what we found were 10 of those 12 patients came back and did it again. So for at least a subset of patients, there seems to be uh, a lasting protection as well, um, suggesting sort of these changes in the immune system being somewhat durable. Now, um, we were able to present this data. Therapy has been shown to successfully desensitize Oops. to varying degrees in small previous Oh, gosh. Studies. Okay. When first the uh, I'm trying to figure out how to make that stop. So lingual immune <laughs> has been shown to successfully desensitize to varying degrees all right, I am going to need some help here. First by the Consortium for Food Allergy Research, COFAR, the second by Johns Hopkins University, and the third by our group at the... All right, so uh, I apologize for that. And um, so I know what that is, is so I had pulled those slides from my presentation from the Quad AI, and the Quad AI had us record those slides, so that's kind of how they showed up with the recordings on there, and I just didn't realize that the, the audio was still there. Um, do you have sort of a suggestion on what I can do on that, or should I just skip past those slides? 
It's Chris or anyone. I'm happy to just um, if that's not awkward for y'all. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure if that would be weird. Um, yeah, I've, I've never had that, so <laughs> I, I don't know how to troubleshoot that. Okay, um, maybe if you all don't mind, maybe I'll just I'll just kind of let it. Um, yeah, I think that's fine. I think you can talk <laughs> over it. We could we could still we could still hear yep. you. Yep, we always come up with something new. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I can, as it, as it's reloading, I can kind of go back over what we were looking at there. So um, resume. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to probably just end up talking over the recording, if you all don't mind. Um, immunotherapy has been shown to successfully desensitize. Or maybe I'll just let it run. <laughs> in small previous clinical trials. The first by the Consortium for Food Allergy Research, COFAR. The second by Johns Hopkins University. And the third by our group at the University of North Carolina. When looking at these studies with regards to age, a possible age effect was seen, with the COFAR group having a median age of 15 years, Hopkins 11.1 years, and our group having the youngest cohort with an age of 5.2 years. Our group had the strongest desensitization with regards to reaction threshold, whereas COFAR had uh, the smallest. And just again, to re rehash that, uh, across these three different studies of sublingual, what we found was uh, seemingly there might be an age difference, which led us to initiating this study, um, which was uh, funded by the FAIR group and looking at peanut sublingual, in this case, with the uh, one to four-year-olds. Um, let's see, and when here we go, we'll let it play. Compliance. There was good compliance with dosing with nearly 92% of doses successfully taken in the sublingual group and 94% of doses taken in the placebo group. Nearly 5% of doses resulted in symptoms in the sublingual group, and like in prior SLID studies, the majority of these were from oral itch. When looking at desensitization, the median amount of peanut tolerated during food challenge after 36 months was 4,443 in the peanut slit group, compared to 143 in the placebo group. 14 of the participants who underwent the 36-month food challenge were able to eat the entire 4,433 milligrams without any symptoms. No patients on the placebo group were able to do the same. Next, looking at biomarkers, on the left, you see peanut-specific IgE, and there was a significant decrease with a median of 5.4 kilounits down to 0.9 after treatment, whereas in the placebo group, there was actually an increase over the course of treatment. When looking at skin testing, similarly, there was a decrease from 10 millimeters at baseline down to 3.3 for the peanut slit group, whereas in the placebo group, the skin test size remained essentially unchanged. And so there, just to summarize, um, uh, again, it seems like there is a, a benefit to starting treatment early on. So we saw stronger uh, levels of desensitization. If you think about pure milligrams, that median was 4,443 milligrams uh, after treatment in that group. And then we compared against placebo, and we're just um, so, so, so grateful. These families actually volunteered for a one-to-one -one placebo to treatment study uh, that actually had them on placebo for three whole years. Um, it's really important that we do that because, again, we don't think a lot of kids outgrow peanut allergy, but if they're going to do it, it's typically going to be in that one to five-year-old age group. And what we found in our, in our study was we didn't have any of those patients outgrow it. Um, but I thought one thing that stood out is um, not necessarily what we're looking for, uh, but we found that the Ig actually went up in the group on placebo. And that's, again, maybe also a sign that just avoidance may not necessarily be a benign thing. And perhaps that uh, that peanut allergy is actually, I don't want, you know, for lack of a better word, getting worse uh, sort of with avoidance. And so maybe also gives sort of more importance to the idea of intervening early, whether it's with sublingual or patch or, or with peanut OIT. Um, but Hopefully, again, sublingual has a future uh, as something that can also desensitize and is going to be relatively easy uh, to do. Now, in the last few minutes, uh, I will use my own voice instead of the recorded one. I do want to talk about some other treatments that are in development that hopefully are really close by. Um, now, first, we've tried to look at novel immunotherapy, so new ways of doing immunotherapy. And uh, the first one is a couple of studies that was done by Hal Allergy. And here, what they try to do is just straight up allergy shots. So they took peanut uh, and went back to allergy shots, but they have sort of their own um, 
uh, proprietary way of chemically modifying as well as using aluminum to try to affect that peanut to, to make it a safer thing than what was seen in the 80s and 90s. Um, and uh, they have looked across ages, um, oldest down to uh, adults, down to kids, and be um, very excited to see what that data ultimately ends up looking like. Because um, if you think about it, every allergy office around the country is built to do allergy shots, uh, not necessarily built to do patch or sublingual or oral. So uh, a, a peanut allergy shot really could be something that could be turned on really quickly across the country if it would work. Estellas Pharma also took an injection approach, but here they were actually using a DNA plasmid vaccine. And of course, vaccine is a major buzzword these days. Uh, but really, they're again trying to bypass um, trying to bypass the immediate effector cells, the basophils and the mast cells, and go straight at your T cells uh, with this DNA approach and see if there's a way that you can create tolerance in a safer way as well. So equally so, we would love to see what that data looks like. Um, now, a lot of us are probably familiar with the dupilumab medication. So this is uh, blocks IL-4 and IL-13 and has shown some great effects when it comes to asthma and with eczema and other allergic diseases. And so first, there's been a study that has been done using this as an adjunct to AR-101. So combining it with the peanut OIT, can this make the peanut OIT potentially um, more effective? Can it be safer? Does it allow us to build up faster and, and maybe help us with that concern about the, the length of, um, of the build-up period, the number of visits? Uh, and that study is on the tail end as well. So that will be another one that would be great to see uh, whether that is a, a, something real that we could be doing in clinics. Both treatments, AR101, uh, now called palforzia, and dupilumab are readily available now. So uh, it could also be something that we could start initiating uh, pretty quickly if we find the efficacy there. Uh, and then a study that is uh, just, just getting started is something uh, run by the Aladuck company called the Harmony Study. And here what they're trying to look at is uh, a multi-OIT formulation, but what's unique here is as opposed to a custom formula that you might be familiar with in some of the other studies, they actually have a one-size-fits-all formula. So they have an investigational product that actually includes all of the top eight allergens all in one, and seeing if that is a way that we can uh, possibly in a more simply way treat people with multi uh, food allergies. And so that would be very, very interesting to see, uh, first of all, the efficacy of this, but also what might that safety be if it's not necessarily customized to that patient. But uh, again, I think uh, just um, an important study just as so many of our patients do have more than just peanut allergy. Biologics, of course, are, are really, really big in allergy and continuing to grow. And um, so one study that is currently ongoing is something called the OutMet study that's run by COFAR. And here what they're looking at is anti-IgE therapy with omeluzumab. And they're looking at it in two phases. One of them is simply as a monotherapy, does it work? So it would theoretically make sense that if you wipe out your IgE that you should be able to make not only your peanut allergy, but really any of your food allergies go away. And so looking at it as a treatment for multi-food allergy uh, as a monotherapy. And then there is a second phase to the study where we are looking at extended therapy with um, omelizumab anti-IgE therapy, but then comparing it to a custom multi-OIT. So an OIT treatment that is focused on whatever those multiple foods that that person is allergic to. And seeing if there is equal efficacy, looking at safety, as well as at the end of all this, what is the real real life outcome? Can we reincorporate some of these foods into the diet? So I think there's going to be a lot of really, really important information that will come out of this study. Uh, and we hope to start having some preliminary data even at the tail end of next year, hopefully. Um, and then I'm going to come back to dupilumab. So, of course, you know, I just mentioned that dupilumab is being considered combined with the peanut OIT, but they're also looking at it as a monotherapy. And could there be, by turning off that TH2 side of your immune system, can we potentially protect people against peanut uh, allergic reactions? And so that study has been ongoing as well, and we'll be curious to see what those results look like. Um, this is less of a treatment study, but uh, you know we continue to have this question of why is so many, why are so many people allergic? Why is there so much more than now than there were in the past? There have been studies uh, out of other countries like Australia that have looked at trying to understand these early life um, triggers of it and birth cohort. And so here in the in the United States, we'd like to do something similar. And so the COFAR 12 study, which has been given the name Sunbeam, is actually our own birth cohort. Really, again, trying to understand what are those risk factors 
uh, for patients who become allergic, and then collecting samples across really everything we can think of to see if we can understand what those potential triggers are, and then maybe to give us some new ideas of therapies that we can use to intervene and actually get rid of those allergies. So currently being done across 12 U.S. sites, recruiting pregnant moms, following them through birth, uh, collecting all kinds of information, biological, but also environmental, and then following the kids out to year, uh, to three years of age to see the development of allergy and possibly even the outgrowth of allergy. Uh, and then finally, the FAIR Clinical Network has been established, and at this point, it's grown to 50 sites, and it covers almost half of the U.S. at this point. And so they are actively, I say they, but we are uh, lucky to be one of the members there, and so we are actually looking at uh, you know, a couple of larger studies that we can um, do as, as a network as a whole that individual sites would never be able to do and see if we can kind of take some new treatment or prevention type studies uh, and, and answer some of those questions as well. And so just in conclusion, food allergies reached epidemic proportions, of course, uh, and like I mentioned up front, that there is not only the physical or the health problems, but the social and economic effects of food allergy that really tell us we need to be actively thinking about something uh, to, to treat this. Um, until 2020, avoidance was the only option, but even since then, uh, peanut OIT is out there, but uh, there are things that may make it harder for some folks, so continuing to think about alternatives is going to be important. Uh, SLID and epicutaneous are advancing. Will they get there or not? We're not sure yet, but uh, it would be great to see if they could be alternatives. Um, and then, of course, these modified versions of all immunotherapy and then the biologics are, are really, really important and also seemingly just around the corner as well. And so with that, um, again, I'll conclude. And um, you know, I'm sorry about sort of the weird snafu with those slides and the, and the audio, but hopefully that wasn't overly distracting. And um, with that, I will stop presenting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Kim. That was fantastic. Great update on uh, therapies for food allergies. Um, I have one quick question, hopefully, and then we'll open up to the rest of the group. Um, you had talked a little bit about, about SLIT and the IgE changes that you saw in, in the treatment group, oh. too, as a biomarker. Um, I'm going to go old school and, and relate this That's to fine. allergy and immunotherapy, but IgG4, are, are we measuring that and do we see any clinical significance if we are? Yeah, I mean, thank you for bringing that up. And so, yeah, the question of IgG4, the question about biomarkers continues to be out there. Uh, and especially now that peanut OIT is an active treatment, like how do we know? We're not, we, we don't want to be doing food challenges all over the place. Um, and really what I would say is the immune changes we have seen across OIT, SLID, and EPIT are mimicking exactly what we've seen in allergy shots. So uh, we see the changes in IgE ultimately going down, and then we see the IgG4 specific to whatever allergen, whether it's peanut uh, or whatever food, we see those going up exactly like what we have seen in allergy shots in the past. Um, so the problem, though, that we've run into right now is actually trying to understand cutoffs or degrees. So um, if we see an IgG4 go up, yeah, that's a great sign that their, you know, their immune system is seeing the allergen and something is happening. But we've not been able to, at this point, connect it to be able to say, okay, you're, you've reached an IgG4 level of X, so now you are protected against this amount of peanut and you can go, you know, go out and do whatever you want to. Um, so that's the stuff that we're sort of still trapped with, is trying to find, you know, are there correlations or, or calculations that we can do that we can then directly correlate into clinical outcomes. And what's, uh, of course, different from allergy, uh, environmental allergies and food is the consequence. So with that, um, environmental, snotty nose, sneezing, maybe asthma, uh, but here where we're talking about potential anaphylaxis. So that's where, uh, again, being able to have those real cutoffs is going to be essential. Does that answer your question, I hope? It, it, it certainly does, yeah. And, it, and kind of conversely, it's just like an IgE dependent of 2 versus 50, knowing what it means to a given patient. Um, it's all over the place on clinical Yeah, sickness. unfortunately. Again, I, you know, I think it's good news to say, look, your immune system is definitely seeing it, uh, and there is a treatment effect here. But again, to be able to give more guidance than that, uh, we're not quite there yet. But, um, you know, these giant studies, they were, they've were they taken, you know, several hundred patients and uh, taken lots and lots and lots of blood samples with that. So hopefully they've been able to show or find things that we haven't found in our smaller studies, and we'll be sharing that with sort of the whole food allergy community and, and help us to, to find out what those cutoffs really are. Yeah. No, fantastic. Thank you. Um, open for questions from the group. Hey, Dr. Kim, quick question. This is sure. Jordan, one of the fellows here at CMH. Um, so is there, um, 
I'm, I'm guessing that there would be less EOE as a side effect um, with slit, but wanted to confirm that with you. Yeah, so we hope so. We hope so. I mean, so far, knock on wood, we've not seen. Um, there's a couple of case reports that have been presented with slit for environmental allergies, uh, seemingly associated with EOE. But in our slit studies themselves, we've not had anyone diagnosed um, with EOE. I will say that our, especially our early study, we had some patients complain about uh, abdominal pain um, and then ended up stopping treatment and that went away. They never made it to GI to get an endoscopy to say for sure, yes or no. So again, I'm going to be a little bit shy to say absolutely not, but uh, so far it does look like uh, it's not sort of the same problem that we think about uh, with peanut OIT at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, all's quiet. Um, Edwin, thanks again. We appreciate it. We hope to see you in the future um, and uh, wish you the best. Thank you very much. Again, I love doing this and thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you. you.